If you haven't heard me, don't click, yet. don't clap yet. I almost said don't click yet. Um, I, the part of two challenges, one aside from not wanting to sound stupid, which is always an issue, I, the, I packed a lot of stuff into this uh, lecture, partly because I didn't know exactly who my audience is, and we could talk about the ironic ramifications of this. But um, so I'm going to try to run through uh, some ideas that I have, hopefully linked together. Um, and I'm really interested in your opinion and your arguments, um, I, even the title uh, down the line. But um, the, the, the idea is multi-part. And it, the first, there's, as you'll see, a number of sort of propositions. One is the movement of media buying, the media buying industry to the center of the advertising system is having profound implications for the ways advertising practitioners confront audiences. What I mean by media buying, I don't know if people even know that term, media buying is simply, at the basic level, the purchase of time and space by a company for an advertiser. Okay? The buying of a 30-second commercial, the buying of a magazine um, page for advertising. But so I'm arguing that the movement of media buying to the center of the advertising system is having profound implications for the ways advertising practitioners confront audiences. The new approaches to audiences are in turn having major consequences for the reshaping of the media system and increasingly for the adverts, that's British, discounts, news, entertainment, and information that individuals confront. Okay, it's that it, these have ramifications for the media system. And into the 21st century, the media buying system's strategy of social discrimination will increasingly define how we as, an, as individuals relate to society, what we get to pay attention to, when we get to pay attention, and how. And one way to talk about this is to call it the daily you. And I'll, I'll try to explain why that is. But, but I'm also arguing toward the end of this that these developments should inform public policy and the ways academics study the developing digital media industries and their audiences. And that's, this latter part is something I'd like to push today because I know there's some graduate students here and in other places in the audience and I'm, I'm very concerned that these are issues that people have to begin to get a handle on. Because few are. Um, okay, so First, the idea of audience power is a contested academic construction of autonomy versus control. You can go through the literature about audiences, and there's a lot of it in uh, media studies and, and elsewhere related to that. Many writings touch on audience power in the analog and digital settings. Um, when I say the daily you, it's a, it's a, a reference to a book by Nicholas Negroponte in which he talks about the daily me with respect to the future of the internet, you know, being digital. The, I, written in the 1990s, his vision was, was quite utopian uh, and very much individual-centered. People will have the autonomy to decide what it is they get through these new uh, vehicles. Uh, a virtual newspaper customized by an individual to taste. And the emphasis was on the power of the reader to decide and somehow it was going to match what you wanted. There's a lot of passive phrasing in, in, that, in his discussions. And people who were concerned about Nicholas Negroponte's projections saw it very much as individual choices. One uh, critic wrote, for example, the services are egocentric. That is, news will be created by what you want and what will that do to society. So it was very much seen as an individually autonomous decision of how you will get news and entertainment, presumably, though he focused on news. Another person who has a very uh, individual and collectivist perspective on this is Yochai Benkler in The Wealth of Networks, a kind of utopian, not pro probably as utopian as Negroponte, but he talks about the collaborative aspects of the internet and the wider um, areas of digital knowledge and the ability of people, he says, uh, to find a platform for better democratic participation as a medium to foster a more critical and self-reflexive culture. You know, that that, the, that that is the essence of what's going on, and, and he writes in The Wealth of Networks that that is what we really ought to be paying attention to, this incredible change. Another person in this arena, uh, for people interested in cultural studies, is Henry Jenkins, who writes in, for example, Convergence Culture, 
uh, about the ability of individuals and groups to take control of the media and to guide the media in ways that they want to do. Um, fans, for example, uh, are, are so important that companies begin to pay attention to them and they participate in the creation of popular culture and that's what we ought to be paying attention to. And he told a journalist uh, in Singapore a couple of years ago, the world has suddenly developed a printing press for every person on the planet. Okay, This notion that now we have a printing press, meaning the internet of course, the web, for every person on the planet. Now, a, a non-utopian perspective on this, but still focusing on the individual's autonomy, is Cass Sunstein in Republic.com, okay, who takes a very different approach to this. But he, too, focuses predominantly on the ability of individuals, the desire of individuals, to polarize themselves. That is, the web allows you to find news that you care about, to go into bailiwicks that you care about, and as a result, we have a polarization of society down the line based upon decisions that people make. They're individual decisions. They tend to be not utopian, obviously. Okay? He's, he's arguing the opposite. But it's still the individual's autonomy to make that decision. But what these guys, I, I would argue, and I'm not disagreeing, by the way, with almost everything they say. Because, in fact, you could argue that Sunstein is correct in many ways. You could argue that Yochai Benkler is correct in many ways. And certainly, um, uh, there's a lot to say for what Jenkins talks about. But I think what we have to do is weigh the relative prominence and importance of what they're talking about in terms of how does that stack up against corporate power and the ability of industries and organizations to exercise autonomy. So questions to ask would be, how broad and deep is this power by individuals and volunteer networks of collaborators compared to the large institutional brokers of cultural and political power in society? Is the new individual or group autonomy the central force that will shape the way people learn about the world and realize opportunities to benefit from it? Or are other factors emerging that will be more important, more decisive? So it's not like I'm saying they're totally wrong by any means. These are the multiple factors that are swirling through our society. The question is, what are the factors that are more important? And obviously, to some extent, this is a judgment call of the critic, of the analyst. But I'm arguing that we haven't paid enough attention to the system and the constraints that the system is placing even on the people that Benkler and Jenkins and uh, others um, talk about, Sunstein. So these questions, of course, are not new with the digital age, the, the idea of human agency against power of media industries. And just briefly to go through, because I don't have a heck of a lot of time, but it's fascinating stuff to go through the history of mass communication research and interest of the, uh, uh, the idea of the autonomy of the individual versus other powers. Uh, So-called mainstream mass media theorists, back to Lazarsfeld and and Merton and, and people like that believe that uh, really was the individual who was, for psychological, social psychological reasons as well as relational reasons, the powerful entity in this. Um, uses and gratifications theory was the idea that people, the audience is powerful. The audience brings itself to the media and makes decisions. Uh, there were counter notions even in the 40s and 50s, and we could bring just a couple of names, George Gerbner, who talked about the idea of the repetition of images, the industrialized production of images, got people to pay attention, not individual shows that changed people's opinion or made a kid beat his sister over the head after watching The Three Stooges, but rather, Gerbner argued, repetitive images about power and about status in society taught people who was strong and who was weak. Dallas Smy, the Canadian, was very interested in the notion of audiences and how he argued audiences are constrained and almost enlisted by um, companies to work for them. I never quite understood what Smy meant back in the 50s when he said that, that, that you're enlisted to be a, an employee in a sense because you, you labor to watch the commercials. But he was prescient in many ways, and, and people are talking about Smythe now in relationship to the internet. Um, if you know about the Frankfurt School, there's a whole history of, of a concern 
uh, a, a, a counter concern with, that is with the industries of, of mass production. And in, in England, the cultural studies work of Raymond Williams and Stuart Hall and David Morley understood that while we have to talk about text, while we have to talk about individual interpretation, there are institutional backdrop, backdrops that guide and, and, and uh, create conduits to preferred understandings and reflect uh, power in society. But there was a shift in cultural studies in the 1980s that made it more like what I referred to as mainstream research. Uh, researchers began to focus partly, and we could go into a whole lots of reasons for this, because of their literary background, began to focus on um, the way individuals interpreted the text. Okay? And part of it, I think, was a, a feeling that it, it isn't as if that they were conservative politically. They were not, quite the opposite. But they said, we can't change the political situation. So what we're going to do is teach people how to resist. We're going to emphasize the way in which individuals read the text and see how people resist. But in doing that, they dropped out of the discussions and the research on the production of culture. And as a consequence, we have studies like Dan Radway reading the romance, Hebdige's work on British punk subculture, Stuart Cosgrove's really interesting work on zoot suiters in East Los Angeles. You know what a zoot suit is? It's a long, uh, you know, um, suit, <laughs> which caused a riot during World War II because of cultural conflicts. Uh, Hispanic uh, young people went out of their way to violate American law and make their suits longer. The, the, the law refused to let them do that because of the war. And when they, do that, when they did that and uh, army people saw them in Los Angeles, they started beating them up. So it was a real, it was a fight that was cultural as well as um, uh, political in other ways. Um, and somebody writing about some of these things writes that these discuss the ways by which consumers may control commercial meaning. Okay? So the idea of, again, the, the individuals controlling commercial meaning. Uh, again, there are people who look in the other direction. So we could point to Robert McChesney and, and critical political economists talking about audience power as illusory, even in the digital domain. And uh, a researcher named Mark Andreevich echoing Dallas Smythe, who talks about how audiences are um, paid to be audiences in this digital world and, and how um, they're, they're controlled in, in doing that. Um, a man named Jose van Dijk, who uh, teaches, I guess, in Amsterdam, uh, argues for a combination of these perspectives. He says, we have to look at user agency as a complex concept involving not only his cultural role as a facilitator of civic engagement and participation, but also his economic meaning as a producer, consumer, and data provider, as well as the user's volatile position in the labor market. In other words, as individuals, we're both where he's arguing where um, people who have certain autonomy with respect to the images that we look at and look to, but at the same time, we're, we're um, couched in, a, in an area where there are uh, political and social power relationships that we're embedded in, and we have to recognize both. Uh, but the thing is, the, and the point I was trying to make earlier, is how do you emphasize it? What is the balance of emphasis? And what I'm... I'd like to argue here is there's not enough work pointing to systemic activities that constrain individuals and groups in terms of what is going on in the media environment today. So the argument here is that the centrality of corporate power is a direct reality at the very heart of the digital age. It's not a tick that refers to the history of the old media. It is, in fact, at the very heart of the digital age. A specific system of organizations within the marketing, within, uh, the marketing system, meaning the media buying system, is, I argue, most responsible for the transformation that is taking place. And I'll explain how that works. To understand key social implications of the digital age, we have to understand that the system, we have to understand that system and its relation to the larger society. And that's my concern, that not enough people are looking at under the hood. 
They're not looking at the, the forces that are guiding the kinds of things that Henry Jenkins talks about. And if you don't understand the forces that are guiding it, you think that it's just the fans that are doing all this stuff. Okay? But when you begin to look underneath, you see a lot different realities. Um, I'd also like to argue, and this goes back to the idea of what academics have to learn, a new language is developing that academics generally do not know. Media academics' understanding of the media system has atrophied. I hate to say that, but I, I have given talks, I'm on a sabbatical this year, and I'm, I've given talks at numbers of universities, and I find that both professors and students, in many cases, do not understand some of the basic changes that are happening. Sure, they understand, you know, people, I don't mean to sound like they're primitive, but there are some really important issues. For example, the C3 rating system. Now, I don't know if that's at all a concern in England, but, but for the last several years, Nielsen has been using a totally different rating system, and they don't know what it is. You know, I'll ask graduate students and some professors in, in a department, a major department, and people just look at me. And I, this is unacceptable. So in other words, people grew up. I know you're not offended by what I'm saying. He's leaving for another reason. <laughs> but but uh, goodbye, Bob. Um, but but you know, people grew up with a certain perspective on traditional media, and it's hard to relearn. And part of what I'm arguing here is the world is really different. Okay, and we have to understand how that difference works. Um, and so that makes it harder than ever to study the workings of media power. So let me talk, if I may, about the rise of the media buying industry. And I'm going to go quickly, and I hope some of this doesn't sound ridiculous. Some of it's still uh, ill-formed, perhaps. But you can listen and maybe critique it later. Um, as I said, the media, media buying uh, comes down to the idea of purchasing time and space on vehicles that companies want people to pay attention to for commercial purposes. Uh, before the 1980s, uh, media buying was part of what was called full service advertising agencies. Agencies did research, they did creative, and they did buying and planning. And that was what a company like JWT did, J. Walter Thompson. Um, today, it stands as the central force in the advertising system. That will really make creatives cry, but the fact is that's what's happening. And, and there are some people who will, in the media buying who will say this explicitly. Um, a guy named David Verklin, who has met, had multiple important roles in the industry, has been saying this for decades. But it is, it is a fact, and, and it's creating some real interesting problems for creatives. Because what is creative? They argue that media buying is the creative essence in today's world. Um, the precursors to the current media buying firms, just to say this uh, quickly to give you a historical context. In the 1960s and 70s, uh, independent media buying companies emerged in Europe and in the United States. Uh, a man named Gilbert Gross launched what became Carat, an important media buying company in France. Uh, in the U.S., independents served direct marketing entrepreneurs such as Ron Popeil. Uh, Ron Popeil was a guy who showed up at uh, 2 in the morning selling gizmos like a vegematic, you know, to cut vegetables and things like that. And he did his own commercials. You wouldn't want to see them, but he did them. He sold a lot of these vegematics. And he, he called himself the greatest salesman in the world. And um, I think he died a couple of months ago, but um, not through his vegematic. But, but, the, but he, um, he needed somebody to buy to place his ads. And so he would go to an independent media company, not a full service ad agency. Another company, Western International Media, worked with Disney to do that. Disney would create its own creative, and then uh, Western International, they worked with uh, Clint Eastwood. You have a question? Oh, they worked with Clint Eastwood as well. Um, in the UK, a lot of this started in the UK, the, the blossoming of this. In the 1970s, uh, an American ad agency called Benton and Bowles uh, was asked by the, uh, the um, uh, Oil of Olay. Uh, the company that owned Oil of Olay, to do only its media buying. They were working, Oil of Olay was, with a, uh, a boutique creative agency. They didn't think they were getting enough good media buying advice. So they went to Benton and Bowles in London, and they created a freestanding company. They said, well, if we're going to do this, maybe we can do it with other companies too. 
So we'll have a separate media buying division, and therefore even people that don't use our creative talents can do media buying. And they, it became, uh, after a while, something called Ray Morgan and Partners, which the Saatchi Group bought, and led to the creation of Zenith Media, which is a big media buying announcement, Zenith OptiMedia. In the 1980s, uh, media buying grew in complexity with the rise of channel fragmentation. Beforehand, media buying was considered the easy part of the industry. Essentially, they would hire women, really, 95% of them were women, out of college to do basic statistical tasks. And the, the hard stuff was the negotiating over drinks and stuff that the high-level executives did in order to buy magazine space or television time. So it was pretty straightforward stuff on the national level. And uh, it was considered not the highest level. It was important to ad agencies because a lot of the money came in through media buying. They got a percentage of the take, 15% in the beginning. But, but um, it wasn't considered the real guts of what advertising was about. Uh, that's very different today, and we have some huge companies. Again, in, in, at least in the United States, most people I know are not familiar with these firms, even in the academic world. These are the big uh, media holding, advertising holding companies, ad agency holding companies. We have to redefine what advertising means. Publicist, WPP, Omnicom, ah, sorry, and Interpublic. And uh, two big companies that are huge in the media buying area are also Aegis and Havas. And uh, this is a couple of years ago uh, that I got the data from this company called RECMA in Paris. But at that time, 58% uh, of media buying, they argued, in the United States, I believe, this is the US, yeah, 58%, near 60% was done by these six companies. So they channel billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars worth of money to media. They have enormous clout. Their idea of what it means to plan and what it means to buy has a determining factor on what companies live or die in many ways. What shows go off the air and don't go off the air. What websites succeed and don't succeed. Okay? That's what we're talking about. And a relatively small number of companies do this. Uh, now in turn, media buying firms began to exploit digital possibilities to redefine their trade to make it more central to marketers. What began to happen is these media buying companies by the late 1980s began to feel, I'm sorry, by the late 1990s, began to feel that they, um, they had huge expectations from the companies that now owned them. Uh, there would be billions of dollars flowing into them and they had to keep up the profits. And so they began to develop the notion that what they brought to advertising is accountability in real sense, accountability. And advertising didn't really have accountability in ways that they could bring it. And so um, first, their idea of accountability was to create optimization models for traditional media and for cable television, statistically trying to show whether one cable channel was better than another in terms of putting money on it to reach a particular audience. But quite quickly in the 1990s and into the 2000s, they began to realize that the new digital media, and particularly in the beginning, the internet, fit that bill perfectly. If they began to understand the internet for their clients, they would be able to, to, be, to be the center of accountability in the advertising agency they worked for. Okay? And that is part of the idea. Now the trick was, to figure out what are the metrics of accountability. How do you think about accountability? And the approach is quantitative measurability of samples, but especially, as we'll see, of individuals to prove return on investment. How do you prove return on investment? Um, interestingly, uh, this is just a quote to show you the importance of how they, the, the importance they placed on this. Money flows to them, it should be two, the most measurable of media. It's why we spend so much money on the Nielsen research. That's by a guy named Barry Leventhal, who uh, headed Kirchenbaum and Baum, still heads the Media Kitchen, which is a, a digital planning agency. And uh, he argued that that's why we spend so much money on Nielsen. As you'll see, it's almost hilarious. Because the, the data that Nielsen bring to the table, and if you compare it with Comscore, so much of this is muddy and muddled. 
okay? It, but it is a creation of reality, whether it's true, and who knows what that really means, or not, becomes a, an instantiation. It's, it becomes real, simply because people believe it, and has enormous implications for the kind of money that gets flowed into various websites, television channels, and elsewhere, and not into newspapers, for example. Uh, and the key insight was the click, which can be seen as a metaphor for measurable, quantifiable human response. Okay? That's what the click was seen as, Measu a metaphor for measurable, quantifiable human response. Now, what I mean by the click here is broader than simply clicking a mouse, although it certainly begins with that. I'm talking about the swiping of a card in Tesco. I'm talking about uh, the clicking of a remote control. Anything that has to do with uh, human interaction in a digital environment that can be tracked, okay, is broadly what I'm referring to. Because in the, in the eyes of these people, that is where accountability can be seen. And today, some of the people in advertising will say, well, we don't pay that much attention to the click. They mean in the very narrow sense. Uh, in many ways, one step removed, the click is terribly important. And uh, as I said, the swipe and the mouse over and all the other things become very important as well as accountable measures. Now, the focus on the click didn't start with Google. Uh, I, I t actually, I used to believe that Google's was really an important, and it still is terribly important, Google's decision to use a click, I'll talk about in a minute. But really, there were key, three key developments in the history of the beginnings of the click. Uh, first, and you can't ignore this, it's really important, the invention of the cookie in Netscape in 1994. It didn't have to be invented, okay? The cookie was a decision to a large extent because marketers wanted to have a way to figure out what people were doing on the internet. Um, in fact, in the beginning, Microsoft said it was not going to allow cookies on its Explorer, okay, in the very beginning. And, and the fact was, you really, you know, there are lots of good reasons for cookies aside from marketers, of course, but you can have non-persistent cookies just session cookies. But the idea that you could have persistent cookies across time was something that was done because this new medium was supposed to be nirvana for being able to know what people are doing. That was the differentiator from a marketing standpoint between the internet and everything that came before it. And if you look at the rhetoric back then, this was going to be the way in which we really knew the internet would tell us what people wanted. Um, a second development was Procter & Gamble, together with Mediacom, which is WPP subsidiary, uh, they came up with an interesting dictum in 1996 that basically said, Procter & Gamble said, we are not going to buy any digital media, any web-based advertising, uh, unless we can, we can pay for it if people click. In other words, they said, we want to know whether our ads were worthwhile, and the way we're going to do that is we will only pay if somebody clicks through. If they don't click through, we're not going to pay. And this caused a, a, a real tizzy in, in a lot of the um, ad world because, gee, this was a whole different perspective. A huge advertiser saying display advertising wasn't going to count unless somebody clicked. Okay? Very different. It was essentially imposing a direct response model onto what Procter & Gamble was doing. And of course, then there was Google's introduction of the auction model with a pay-per-click payment scheme in around 2001. So these together had some really important ramifications for how marketers uh, and the world began to see what it meant to be online from a commercial standpoint. Um, and you have the uh, direct response model of, of advertising, which trumped display ads. Banner ads became nothing. You know, and so the idea was you had, and we can't go into what this means, but certainly Google AdWords, you, you know, probably AdSense and email marketing were the way in which to evaluate whether people were doing the right thing. Um, pay per click and also in, in some cases, pay per action. That is, did a person buy something? Did a person read a particular thing? Um, interestingly too, and we often forget this, I would argue, in 2003 was the beginning of search engine optimization companies, okay? So what you begin having now is an ecosystem developing around the idea of clicking, 
around the notion that a response is important, and how do you jigger that response in your interest? And so, so you, you have this uh, beginning of a major ecosystem built around the notion of, of individual interactivity. But that was only the beginning. To impress major advertisers, media, the media buying industry had to make the click relevant to image and display ads, as I've just suggested. You, you know, Procter & Gamble can't live just on clicks. And this is beginning to be true, particularly now. Companies are beginning to say, you know, the click-through rate is unbelievably low. The number of people who click on, on an ad is minuscule. And what's fascinating is, if you look in the 2000s, every time a new technology came in, the clicks would go up. So everybody would get excited. Video ads, people click. You know, audio ads, people click. And, but, but they go down again to below 1%. And the reason Google makes so much money is because it has billions of people coming there and, and you know, a billion people click out of 20 billion or something like that. So as a result, you get, it makes money. But if you're a newspaper, if you're a magazine, uh, and it, certainly an individual website can't rely on that. They try to rely on, on Google in terms of some, and some, we'll talk about ad networks, but it's, it's much more complicated. And then people began to say, hey, display ads may have consequence. But then the question is, how do you measure that? Because it's no longer possible to use a television measure of saying, gee, you know, 20,000 people during this hour went to um, the New York Times. They, they, they wanted to say, OK, tell me how this worked, even if it's a display ad. So what you have is the rise of the media buying industry and its desire for increasing credibility and centrality, as I was just suggesting led its leaders, has led its leaders to take two approaches to the audience, okay? Which, uh, this idea of people clicking, we need accountability, but there's a rhetoric that comes along with it as well as activities. One rhetoric is what I call the rhetoric of supreme audience power, meaning these are, and we'll talk about that. And the second is surreptitious activities that aim to negotiate and channel audience interests in the service of advertisers. That is, figuring out what people are doing but not letting them know about it. And again, this is just the rhetoric. I'll read it quickly. In 1994, uh, Rust and Oliver predicted, quote, the death of advertising in the Journal of Advertising. They related it to the simultaneous increase in media fragmentation and audience power. And they wrote, in advertising's prime, producers held virtually all of the power in the marketplace. This was true in part because their agents, the advertising agencies, controlled then very powerful mass media. Producers control the products, terms, and conditions of sale and the communications environment. Power has been steadily shifting toward the consumer. That's the rhetoric. And you see this throughout the trade press. Now, I would argue that one utility, and I'm not saying they don't totally believe this to some extent within a certain frame, but the utility of saying this and getting people to hear it, particularly at the governmental level, if you keep saying that people are so powerful, then it's not so terrible to do things powerfully back that some people might say, are not necessarily the best thing for people. You know, we, this consumer is king, so then maybe we can follow them. If they're so strong, you know, it's OK. It's not going to hurt anybody, see? That kind of thing. Um, Rishad Tabakawala, whose name I love, he's the head of uh, Denuo, and, and he, uh, which is part of, these things are nested uh, inside, nested inside everything. It's, uh, it's, it's owned by publicists, eventually. Um, and he wrote, uh, and this is typical, this is from an interview of his. When it comes to connecting and communicating, people want three things, Tabakawala says. First, they want access, access to content and to people at any time, in any place, on any device. Secondly, they want participation. And third, they want empowerment. And not just any old empowerment, Tabakawala notes. They want to be like gods, limited by neither time nor space. Thus, he says, marketers must learn to live in the world of the omniscient consumer. Okay. It's an amazing you know, image of the consumer. And a 2009 Ogilvy One report on mobile advertising said that in 2020, pushing messages out of unwilling consumers is replaced with producing ideas and content that individuals seek out and incorporate into their own world. And we'll all be very happy. OK, so the transformation of audience choice and initiative is certainly real. In other words, there are great examples of how a recognition of power by audiences. Just go into a store, like a, an appliance store, and you'll, I, I think Sears does this, 
where you can go to a kiosk and go online to see what other companies charge for the same stuff. And the idea is then they say, well, you know, you can either stay at Sears or drive 15 miles to that other place. And a lot of people will stay there anyway. See? So there's a certain kind of empowerment. We could all talk about those kinds of examples. Uh, but the fixation on audience movement, choice, and autonomy, rather than on traditional psychological barriers to reaching audiences, foregrounds the importance of media buying and related analytics. That reinforces the, the media buying industry's movement to the center of power in the advertising system. If you believe the, the audience is powerful, you have to find ways to get them to sort of move in your direction. You have to understand them, you have to track them, and you have to figure out ways to know that they're there and to know that you're around them. Moreover, emphasizing audience power, as I suggested earlier, helps the media buying industry to cover the fact that it is involved in a range of activities aimed at channeling audience choices and initiatives towards clients' ends. Okay, so there are two ways, broadly speaking, that companies uh, follow audiences, as we might say. One is traditional scouting, and the other, and maybe this isn't the best word because it has negative connotations, but I would call it stalking. They both start with S's. Traditional scouting to predict where types of people will be and how to influence them. So there are growth of analytics firms to become the dominant source for audience measurement data derived from so-called click stream databases. In other words, following what mothers do. And you derive a database about what mothers do online, for example, and then you, f you see a mother and you figure she's similar to that. Or we know that mothers do X, Y, Z when they're looking for baby carriages. So basically, we generalize about mothers. Some of it is used for scouting, some of the data uh, activities. Some for stalking. Uh, for example, behavioral tracking within and across media. Ad networks facilitate this on the web. Um, phone operators and networks do it on, on mobile. They follow you around. Stores facilitate it elsewhere out of home. Okay, stores track a lot of things that you do, and Tesco, for example, if you have a frequent shopper card, has huge amounts of information about you. Um, and what I would argue, a lot of times when people talk about this, they discuss the difference between personally identifiable information, PII, and other kinds, as if if you don't have personally identifiable information about someone, it's okay. My argument here is that that's a red herring, okay? Because the way people are living online today it doesn't matter if they know that my name is Joe Turo, okay? They, if they have a number of me that links to an enormous number of things that I have done uh, or put me in a bailiwick, that characterizes me and may have implications for the discounts I get, the ads that I see, eventually as we'll see the news and entertainment that I receive, okay? So it's not, PII can be a problematic divider if you, if you look at it that way. Um, and, and people don't realize a lot of companies don't care about, uh, will say, we don't collect your personal information. Privacy policies are terribly difficult to read and they're, very, they're, they're impossible to understand, uh, partly purposefully, and we can go into this. But I just want to give you a sense of buy.com's privacy policy, which isn't. Uh, it says, except as limited below, we reserve the right to use or disclose your personally identifiable information for business reasons in whatever manner desired. We also track customers' patterns throughout their online session, including which pages, information, and advertisements a customer views while using the site and what items they place in their basket or purchase. We believe you should have the ability to access and edit the personal information that you have provided to us. See. And I don't know any other any website that actually, um, and we can get into this, what Google tells you they know about you. But generally speaking, websites will say, you can correct what you have told us. Okay? They won't really tell you the great amount of stuff that they have about you, whether PII or not. Uh, Post-checkout credit card information transfers is a big deal on some sites. I don't know if anybody here, go, I don't know if it's in the UK, but Fandango is a movie uh, checkout place and what they were doing is they were, my daughter fell into this trap, um, when you check out to buy a movie ticket they would offer you a discount and make it really hard to find how to get out of that page. So if you hit OK and you haven't read all the verbiage on the side 
they automatically transferred your credit card number to this company so that you bought a discount card which took $13 off of your bank account every month or your credit card every month. And the Federal Trade Commission got involved in this. The company said, well, the, the words are there. It's all written down. But of course, people didn't read it. They were trying to figure out how to get out of that page. OK, a complementary approach um, with an E is audience research as an act as actuarial analysis. And I think that's a really important thing. It somehow dovetails with what I'm talking about. Google is fundamentally two things, actually. It's an advertising business, right? And it is an actuarial business. By actuarial, I mean Google studies incredibly well what people do online and tries to figure out statistically what that means in terms of searches and in terms of click-through patterns. It's a predictive company. They, they are fundamentally concerned with predictions. And, um, and so statisticians and engineers and computer scientists who deal in that world are incredibly desired by them. So a lot of audience research today is actuarial analysis. Um, and uh, I, I, I was at Microsoft not too long ago and saw some of this and talked to some people who are doing this. It's fascinating stuff and not at all easy by any means. And, and uh, one person was quoted from Microsoft, uh, Youngbin Song, saying advertising, um, and this is fascinating, but this gives you a sense of what we're talking about. Advertising to a behaviorally targeted prospect 12.5 days before a purchase acts, actually maximizes the branding effect. This is when consumers start their preliminary research outside of direct search sites and can be located and addressed with behaviorally targeted display at an earlier stage, long before they start hitting the query box and have perhaps already made a brand choice. So for example, if you're interested in buying, if you see that a mother is, is uh, pregnant, a person is pregnant, and you then have all this actuarial data about when pregnant women begin thinking about buying baby carriages. This kind of is, is the direction he's talking about. A certain number of days within a particular moment of a person's life is what we deal with. See? And that's why, after a point, Google and Yahoo and other companies don't mind giving up uh, cookie data, de-anonymizing it, uh, I mean, totally, um, well, they keep it, um, uh, anonymizing it, I should say, because some of this stuff is old. I've spoken to people in third-party advertising sites that they make money by tracking people, and they give up their cookies after like five or six days because a person is only in a particular interest, consuming interest at a particular point in time. So other stuff may be kept. That's kind of ambiguous. Uh, de demographic, for example. So a lot of this has, uh, ends up dealing with the buying and selling of cookies, which we can't get into in... Uh, any kind of detail, but a cookie, as you know, is a text file that is placed in a person's computer, and uh, a lot of the data is connected increasingly to databases that companies have in their own website, in their own storage areas and servers. And, and, the, um, and increasingly, cookies are being shared. They're being placed on websites by companies that then sell the cookies to companies who need particular profiles of individuals. And the sort of holy grail today, which may never come to be, but there are versions that one can see of this, is a universal cookie. That is a cookie that, that anybody with the right permission, any company could access and therefore have data about you anywhere you went across the web. Right now, a company that puts a cookie in really can't know where you go except where you've been, where it has ability to replace that cookie and see you. Okay, which can be thousands and thousands of sites. But eventually the idea would be anywhere you go. And to some extent, that's why Google is so fortunate, because people keep coming back to Google. And they keep searching. And Google, therefore, has a lot more knowledge about what you are than a lot of other companies. Uh, Dave Morgan is, a, is an important internet entrepreneur. And he was talking to Steve Smith. He said, BT, meaning behavioral targeting, really embodies and realizes the key differentiator digital marketing brought to the table. Its real-time two-way path of interactivity allowed for user profiling and one-to-one -one targeting that no other medium possessed. Selling ads against pages 
is just porting an old model to the new medium. Selling ads against audiences is where digital truly distinguishes itself and where the big money waits. Now this is kind of utopian on his end and a bit rosy. It, it isn't quite there totally yet, though some people would say it is. But increasingly the idea is we don't buy uh, media, we buy individual impressions. You can now buy real-time impressions of people right as they're going onto a website. So you can actually bid for an 18 to 24 year old woman, maybe a 22 year old woman, who is looking for a car at the moment that she's entering a particular website. So you're buying an impression. And you could do this, you know, you buy 50,000 of them. Computers will do this, not individuals sit there. But that's at the point, the point is, which raises fascinating questions about the importance of context. It used to be considered that media context was terribly important. What show you advertised on was important, not wrestling, but a more uplifting kind of thing was good for General Electric. Okay? But then the question becomes, is this, what if you can really know where that person is? Does it matter if you advertise on ESPN or Joe Schmo's sports site? If you're going to get that person and pay a lot less money for it. Now you could argue both ways, but it has some real ramifications one way or another for the shape of the media system, right? Um, the ultimate goal is the long click, I would argue, what I call the long click, which is uh, basically being able in a, in, a, in a world that I've been talking about where you want to have digital advertising, I mean a display advertising, branding advertising, to prove that what I saw here led me to buy something there when I swiped my credit card or did something else or responded to an email. So there's no direct uh, obvious link right at the moment to the ad, but I can track what the person has done down the line. Okay? Maybe through what I did on my, you follow me on the phone and give me a discount again and see whether I go ahead and di do something that also related to what I watched on your display ad. Just to give you a sense, we can't go through this, but this is from a white paper that a, a group called the Winterberry Group, a consulting firm, put together. And just give you a sense of the kinds of uh, data that are beginning to be co collected. Geographic, technographic, demographic, psychographic, social, and transactional. Across a variety of sources, some traditional, some you couldn't have gotten through traditional. A whole variety of companies involved in this. Uh, as I say, a new ecosystem is being created in which the idea of, of accountability through human interaction is central. Um, and there's a critical link here to in-store and mobile data, right? That's, uh, you know, the, the ability, the mobile phone is a boon to many of these companies because of the ability to follow people. And that's why Google is so keen on Android and its new phone uh, to, to be, get around phone companies which hold a lot of your data and are much more conservative about their use of data than some of the other companies. Um, harnessing social media has become a crucial aspect of the pro uh, process. So Huffington Post has made a deal with Facebook to uh, interrelate activities. So you can go on a special page in Huffington Post and talk about what you've read on the Huffington Post and your Facebook friends will find out about it, you know, and it gets the, the stuff gets shared. But at the same time that you're doing it and your friends are doing it, third party advertisers that go on to uh, Huffington Post are dropping cookies in your and their uh, computers and beginning to follow you around. Um, you've heard about the new Facebook privacy rules. You really ought to go on there and change your Facebook privacy settings. It's not intuitive at all. And it is, um, apart from any of that, things get left out. So right now, uh, your name is searchable, and so is the names of your friends. You can't stop that, okay? And clearly the reason that Facebook did this is because um, they need to have an outlet for advertisers, um, to, to attract advertisers and, and get people to, uh, to go to Facebook through search. Um, the, uh, there are lots of interesting implications to this, particularly also with apps. That's a whole separate issue of the Facebook privacy area. If you get an app through Facebook, uh, the app provider can also access a whole lot of data that you may not know about, about you and your friends. So you have to go in there and change that part too. It's becoming a big deal to work 
to work, as Dallas Mike would say, in the media today as a member of the audience. You really have to know this stuff. And the problem is, you know, people make fun and say people don't know anything. And I say a lot. We'll just show you some research. People don't know a lot of this stuff. But it's not because people are stupid. And it's also not because they don't care about privacy or privacy. It's because they have a life, OK? And people have different things to do in their world. And they can't know what an engineer knows about or a media professor knows about uh, the internet or any digital networks. And just to, to make the point about, about muddled data, uh, and again, we can't go into this, we can talk about it later. Nielsen and Comscore, there was an example recently about, um, I believe it was Twitter, one of the big uh, fancy new sites, where the difference between Nielsen and Comscore as, as to how many people were going there uh, were something that were, were separated by 30 million. And the number of questions, I have it written down somewhere, was there was a 300 million number difference. Okay, it was just amazing. It was, we're talking about big numbers here. And I could go into some detail about why one company is different from the other and how they get their samples. But these are, the data that these companies put out are used by media people to make decisions. They're not stupid either, and they know that this causes trouble, and they try to check. But we're dealing not with any kind of accurate representation of the world here. Um, as people in the early utopian days of the internet believed that somehow this was going to give us transparent representation. Um, the, the data that some of the research links cookie data with non-cookie information in ways that are problematic in terms of inference, you know, logically problematic. Um, companies infer from general data to targeting an individual in ways that are conceptually problematic. So even when we have these data, I'm not talking about that these things are accurate, okay? They, they are inherently in many, time, many times problematic. But whether they're accurate or not, they have consequences. As, we've, as I've suggested, in terms of what people get and how people are approached. Now, marketers want to uncouple linear media from ads, from ads to individuals. They realize that people are increasingly not reading or watching things the way that most people used to, uh, but rather uh, they're going every which place and going online to get different shows instead of watching cable. And as a consequence, uh, and this relates to what I brought up before, the issue of does context matter? The key is a relevant content environment with tailored ads and coupons. As long as it's relevant and you can tailor the stuff to the people, that's what counts. Uh, and you have companies we can talk about later. Visible World, Canoe are working to tailor ads with television. TV is not lost here. You know, we could talk about the problems of magazines and newspapers. The TV world is changing drastically, whether we want to call it television or not. Uh, is another story. And the television world is going to be on top of what's happening here. Whether it's the same old companies or not is another issue. Uh, expectation of cross-platform integration is based on measurable data that tracks audience types and individuals. That is, following people across a whole variety of platforms and trying to deal with them in terms of what they want uh, lends a whole different life to what uh, Jenkins talked about is tailored news and entertainment agendas, and even tailored news and entertainment, far behind? I would argue no. So for example, Google's goal, according to a book I just finished reading that came out last month, I guess, um, about Google, it's called Googled, talks about using Google's goal is to use behavioral targeting and demographics to serve newspaper content to people, specific content based upon what they think they know about you, uh, and, and to help monetize the newspaper and make money for Google. We will see the increased dispersion of cookies by search engines, portals, third-party advertisers, and, pub and publishing confederations to get more information about people. The goal is to increase the value of ads and show evidence of the long click. And as we see newspapers getting panickier and panickier, we're going to see more of this happening. It's the, 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 the fetish of getting to know more about your audience in order to raise the price of the ad, because that's the way they're going to do it, is going to be more and more important. And I would argue that as federations share people's knowledge about people, we will have what I call reputation silos. That is, people will be tagged in certain ways. You are one thing and another thing. And as a consequence, your reputation will follow you. 
and the discounts you get and the news you get and the entertainment even that you get may relate to the reputation that you've developed online. And you may or may not know that. Uh, and I don't have all that much time, but I want to point out media firms are morphing to fit the bandwagon if they can. And I'll just briefly say this, church state traditions are getting destroyed with no transparency in magazines and on blogs. Like mommy bloggers being essentially paid to blog about, uh, about what advertisers send them. Analog media executives are panicking the most. Magazines are transforming to become multimedia advertising platforms. The physical newspaper has the greatest difficulty, not least of which because norms make product integration difficult. You can't say to a reporter, integrate this product into your story. Though Time Magazine, I guess Newsweek tried it, no Time, tried it with a movie a year or so ago. Most of this takes place below the public radar. And I just want to emphasize one thing here in terms of that. Uh, four times we've asked a national, three times national, once California state uh, in a survey. To, to, true or false, if a website has a privacy policy, it means the site cannot share information about you with other companies unless you give the website your permission. This is pretty well standard. Generally speaking, what we find is 75% of Americans get that wrong. The answer is that it's, it's false. But 75%, six, about 60% say it's true, and 15% say they don't know. So there's an enormous lack of knowledge about the label privacy policy. And what we've suggested is that the Federal Trade Commission say that unless you do this, unless you say we're not going to share it, don't call it a privacy policy. The problem is that nobody wants to go that way, because that's scary. That begins to clue people in. And even if, if you do say this, if your third-party advertisers don't say that, you still wouldn't be able to say it, and that's what scares people the most. Um, it's impossible, typically, and we can get into the schools on the other thing, to find out what companies know about you, why, and how they use it. When people start deleting cookies, actually the newer browsers can delete cookies, some companies replace them with flash cookies. To further justify behavioral tracking, marketers say audiences want material tailored for them. And we've done some research that shows that it's not as simple as that. A lot of young people, even, don't want to have stuff tailored for them. They want to customize things themselves, but they don't want things tailored for them. Marketers also say young audiences don't mind being tracked, which we found is not necessarily the case. Now, over the past decade and a half, uh, people have really gotten, uh, we, the, I say these activities deserve serious public understanding and examination. Over the past decade and a half, they've gotten neither. Many still think that advertising is equivalent to creative work we see in magazines and on newspapers. But 61% of WPP revenue comes from non-trade services such as direct advertising, digital, PR, and research. We need a social discussion about where this all is leading. But to help, academics need to know the new media system and its new language. I'm not going to go into all this. But you know, these are important things. And even new meaning of words like television and publisher. It's very complicated. If I say to somebody, a publisher, most people would think Time Magazine, uh, you know, HarperCollins, right? Well, Collins, I guess it's called now. But, but um, publisher on the web is any company that produces content for people. And it gets really complicated. How are we using these terms? Television is morphing, and some companies don't use the term anymore, though. Ad agencies will say multi-channel subscription video services. Okay. So we're, we're in a new world um, about coded language. Even the word user, I'm not comfortable with that word. But if you say citizen, it sounds pompous. The audience is, these are, we have to have a new set of understandings here. The new power of advertising is not just to sell and to decide what media survive or even to reinforce larger social values. The power of advertising increasingly is the power to surround individuals with ad managed versions of themselves and their values, what I call reputation silos, that constrain the way they approach media and the larger world. It's an enormous power people need to understand. The policy challenge is how to encourage a regime of information respect through information reciprocity, rather than just work toward counteracting and channeling audience power. Thank you. Well, thanks for that tutorial and, and wake-up call. Uh,
But let me take questions, and I'll, I'll carry this around so that we can get these on tape if anyone has a question. I'm just wondering, it looks like a little bit of controversy. You started uh, from the overview of what uh, academics believe uh, power uh, and where power is currently in, in terms of uh, the whole balance of uh, brands and consumer and people. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that uh, actually people now, the person is the one who selects where she, he or she goes and what they want to mm -hmm. consume and what they want to see. But in fact, what we see here from the kind of media landscape, that it's actually, uh, again, companies through media agencies, the ones who are controlling the, the whole market, the whole world, and how consumers are treated, how they, you know, what, what they see and when they sold something. So uh, do you think there's a controversy in it or it's well I think I guess first of all it's not I'm not trying to totalize it there are people do have a certain kind of independence about all this it's not like we live in a box where we're totally but the fact is that this is an area we don't pay attention to that more and more and I would argue if we don't pay attention to this we'll see it increasingly that under the guise of people want to have stuff tailored to their attention we will see that uh, this happens increasingly and uh, if we ignore the dynamics of it and keep valorizing the ability of individuals to do whatever they want, uh, I think we're going to see 15 years from now that this is going to become even more the case. And then we'll accept it. It's like, I remember in 1980, uh, there was something in the US called program length commercials. And they were commercials where a company would take a toy that was popular and make a show about it. And there was a big brouhaha about it. I remember giving a talk at a congressional panel about it. And I did say at the time that, you know, if you guys don't do anything about this now, in 20 years, nobody's going to care. It's going to be part of the landscape. And in fact, Discovery is now setting up a channel with Hasbro that's totally based on toys, you know, for children. And we don't think of this as a problem anymore. It's simply part of life that, gee, yeah, Transformers is everything. You know? mm -hmm. So um, it, it is, it's a, after a while, people will accept just about anything. And the question is, is that what we want our, ourselves and our society to be? Just a, just a little comment on that one. Uh, I've been working as actually as a media buyer uh, for hmm. Harvest Digital. Did I say anything wrong? Uh, no, no. I just oh. uh, just mentioned in the future, and there's a big trend now. Uh, a lot of agencies themselves initiate kind of uh, restrict themselves in terms of how much data they store and how they mm -hmm. use behavioral targeting just purely because they are anticipating uh, this kind of uh, public. Uh, uh, opinions about concern. Yeah, yeah. concerns. And it, it is true, I think, that the European Union is somewhat more uh, philosophically concerned about this than, than in the United States. But at least when I look at the trade press and talk to people in the business, they kind of figure that anything they want to do, they can do anyway. Because what you have to do is you have to get permission. And, and you, if you tell a person you're going to get stuff that's terrific, you know, just tell us that we can do this. And, you know, if you don't do stupid things like Form did, you know, you can pretty well do a lot of things. As I say, Tesco, you know, the, but yeah, there are, and, and believe me, there are people who worry about this stuff in the business. Uh, and they're not, we're not talking about evil people, okay? It's, it's a question of people wanting to make money. And the companies that are doing the most forward thinking things like this are not necessarily uh, the biggest firms. There are these tiny companies all around that are doing amazing things with people's information, you know, and buying stuff from, from Experian and, and Axiom and big database companies and mixing them with, with data in ways that may or may not have anything to do with reality. But there's a whole world out there of these companies that are selling the data to the media agencies. And the whole question of whether there's a whole issue about media agencies' existence, you know, are, is, is Google going to try to take the place of a media agency, for example. Yeah, I wanted to ask, I mean, you're painting a picture here of an extremely powerful system mm -hmm. um, that is uh, imposing its will on people 
um, perhaps unconsciously or perhaps channeling people's mm. choices, I suppose, in a particular way. So let me, let me ask what struck me as I was thinking about this as uh, a question about the limits of the system. Mm -hmm. um, if this system can, challenge, can channel people effectively, then why are CD sales declining? What's the, what's the problem with the music industry that it's unable to uh, use behavioral targeting to uh, at least keep consistent CD well, sales? Uh, actually, there are two questions, very interesting question. Uh, let me, th there are a couple of things. One, uh, we're at the cusp of a new era. A lot of the things I was talking about are really forward thinking in the terms of not, be, not forward like I'm a prophet, but there's an industry logic that I was referring to and how that works. But to answer your question more directly, CDs are declining because two reasons. One, people figured out how to get the stuff for free digitally, and also they buy stuff on iTunes, right? But still, CDs are like 60% of the market, okay? The second answer, though, is I'm not arguing that this means that companies have found ways to be more persuasive, okay? That's, that's exactly what I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing that this has anything to do with the power of advertising to persuade people in terms of changing their buying habits. I'm arguing that whatever they do, whether they're right or wrong, even if they screw up in terms of persuasion, they are making decisions that affect the existence of media and that affect how they look at you and me. So that even if they get it wrong and I don't buy a particular product, the fact that they characterize me as a 75-year-old man who likes Jefferson Airplane or Star you know, Ship or something like that. I'm not 75, but they got it, <laughs> they got it wrong, see? Uh, the, the, um, that's what's important, okay? The, the, the characterizations, the profiles, the portrayals, and the power over media, which in many ways is, is just as important. The life and death of the media system and its, and its shape is being structured through these activities, whether they have any consequence for power or not, for, for persuasive power. Um, so if they succeed in channeling everybody, and at the same time right now anybody can be a publisher, mm. do you think the shape of who publishes and what they publish on the internet as individuals Change. Again, I don't want to make it totalizing, but I would argue that down the line, if you buy into the Google's idea, for example, that it knows, I've heard Eric Schmidt say that, he wouldn't say this anymore because they're more touchy about this, but he said at one time, we want you to see Google as the place to go to find out what profession you should be in. That we will know so much about you that we will be able to tell you more about yourself than you know, okay? And so the idea, if you buy into the notion that Google should give you the best news, you know, like my Yahoo, only this is my Yahoo shaped through Google's sense of we can get you to know what you need to succeed in your, in your work and all this kind of, then you begin to be surrounded in some ways by a view of the world that may get reinforced by the status you're in and essentially may in fact shape the kinds of things you write and the kinds of things you think about. It's a kind of agenda setting that is personalized and group based. When I go to a coffee shop, um, my local coffee shop, they know, you know who I am because I go there every day mm. and they start making my coffee before you know, I walk in the door. Is there anything like wrong with that? No, not at all. I, I totally, yeah, and that's another thing I think uh, people misunderstand. I am not saying that it's wrong for a person or, I'm not even against behavioral targeting. I, I partly I am, but it's it's the the fact is it's that that horse has left the barn, the stable. What I'm against is the knowledge of where it comes from. When you when you go, I mean, unless this person is particularly uh, um, anal, he's not going to start writing a record of you that you have no idea about in a back room, listing things that he thinks about you. Um, and all of that, he, he knows you and you know him and it's a pretty upfront idea of how that works. I wouldn't have a problem with a lot of this stuff if these companies in fact said, this is where, in fact, I've, I've suggested ideas. If, it, if an ad is tailored to you, put a little T there. Let me click on it and let me find out where, why you tailored it that way. What do you know about me? How can I respond? What control? 
That's what I mean by information respect, a kind of reciprocity. Today, the debate, at least in the United States, around privacy has to do with harm, a lot of it, and with intrusion into people's machines. Okay? What I'm arguing is that there's another way to think about this, which is people should be respected. There's an, and, and I mean, it sounds a little bit hokey, but I don't think it is, because they're, they're trying to say we respect our customer, our customer's king. What does it mean to have respect in this environment? If you take my information, then tell me about it. Tell me where you got it from. And let me have control over it to tell you, I don't want you to use this. I don't want you to do that. There's another part of that, which is the more people get really, in, at least I would argue this, the more people get really involved in, use, in relating to their information, almost like a game, you could say, the more they'll be educated about it. And there'll be a literacy that, at this point, people don't have. So I agree with you. There's nothing wrong with any of that. And I like to get stuff that's related to me. But I want to know where it came from and why they think that. Um, following on from the answer you've just given, and you talked about individuals being able to tailor their own information, but that would be difficult. Mm -hmm. Can you see a growth in that, whereby um, perhaps we have ad blockers? Mm -hmm. And I believe at the moment Firefox have introduced mm -hmm. something where you can see some of this information, whether you can block your cookies automatically. Yes, there So, in more fact, and more. we'll be controlling. Mm -hmm. We don't know what information we're giving the other people. Yeah, and there are ways to do this. You're absolutely right. There are anonymizers. Uh, if people know about this, they can control, stop the cookies. Um, there is something called the NAI, the National Advertising Initiative in the States, where you can go and somehow remove yourself from cookies. Um, Google has this thing that I mentioned where you can go find out supposedly what Google knows about you. A very, very small percentage of people does do that. Um, the other thing about it is that uh, some of it, if you go to the Google thing um, and see what they know about you, it seems so benign that a person like me would be ridiculous. I mean, it says stuff like, you like to travel, OK? Uh, who could disagree? What's so terrible about this? It makes me look like an idiot, OK? But, but really, it, it totally ignores the kinds of stuff that Google has behind the screen that they're doing actuarially that has to do with the kinds of stuff they serve you. Okay? It, has to, it ignores what Google's probably eventually going to be trying to do. Um, and it ignores what a lot of uh, third party advertisers who work with Google do. Okay? And they, in fact, do follow you and tra trace you and all that. So there's a lot going on behind the fact that you like to travel. Um, but you're absolutely right. If everybody took carefully, even the Facebook thing, It'll be really interesting to see how many people go in and change their... What happened, there was a reset in Facebook, a reset. So even if at one point you went and did this, now you're resetting. Now they told people that it happened. It'll be interesting to see how many people actually go in and do it. And you may say, well, then it's their responsibility. But, sorry. You said that you can't tell a reporter to go and tell him what to write. but. The scenario you describe, I can really imagine the reporter being told to give, give the people the news that they like to read. And yes. The, and the nasty stuff just gets, right. doesn't get reported. And um, we, you know, I think you're absolutely right. I, there was a rumor a few years ago, which I have never pinned down, that some newspaper began to actually change headlines depending on the neighborhood that the, the stories were going into. I don't know if that's at all true. Maybe one of these urban myths. But I can see that beginning to happen, and, and I can see how people would justify that. And it's not all that different from going the next step that you're talking about. If you know that a person has a particular political persuasion. See, once you begin to say, the, the real interesting thing here, and I'm thinking ahead, but this is how these people think. Once you begin to say, context is not important if I can buy really cheap ads, okay? It doesn't matter whether I do Joe Schmo's sports site or ESPN. So then ESPN says, we have to do something that will justify the enormous amount of money that we're spending on our sports uh, material. So then what we do is they do research that says, if people come to ESPN and they have tailored ads, uh, tailored content for them, if we know that Joe Turo likes football, OK, and then we, we show him that right from the get-go, which is sort of what Google is thinking, then 
he will pay a lot more attention to your ad than if you go to Joe Schmo's sports site, which is cheap stuff, and they just show him anything that's on their front page. Okay? So there is an encouragement then, I'm arguing, to begin to tailor ads based on the kinds of things you're talking about. The more you know about a person, the more that person is engaged with not only the content, but the ads. There's been decades of studies of what kinds of shows will elicit more response. There are some products that supposedly do well with dramas compared to comedies, believe it or not. And the research is kind of screwy. But there are histories of advertising agencies believing that certain project products go with certain kinds of genres and not with other genres. And I'm arguing the same thing can easily happen when we're dealing with these kinds of websites uh, that have to justify their existence increasingly. Joe, can I wedge a question in here? Yes, sir. Uh, is there another slide or something which goes on? <laughs> because I think the information respect won't work. I mean, I mean, given your description, it's too bad. I want privacy make... policy yeah. and Facebook and Google. It's hopeless. I mean, isn't there a necessity for some type of uh, regulation policy intervention? Or, well, uh, and what would that uh, David be? David wants to. Yeah. Of? David, did you want to add to that? Now I'll come right back to you, Patty. Um, yeah, I, I sort of wanted to push through, for, push you a bit further on this, just as, as Bill did, really, on, on mm -hmm. sort of uh, regulations, revenues, and race to the bottom, really, mm. which is uh, when you're talking about privacy, in some ways it seems an issue about regulation, that in a sense mm -hmm. states can decide or the European Union in this, in this part of the world can decide how they want to regulate those things. Mm -hmm. And it's quite shocking in a way that when the Facebook decision, I think 350 million users of Facebook, and the default setting was changed mm -hmm. by a, corp a corporation yes. in the absence of any regulation, where there's whole areas of privacy law yeah. where whether you opt in or whether you opt out is a really big regulatory issue. But there's, there's a regulatory problem there. On the revenue problem, it strikes me that you're, what you're discussing is a way of making media even more, much, much more accountable to advertisers. And, you know, in one sense, that's an optimistic sign for people who want to say, how do we raise revenue to support content creation? Mm -hmm. But another side, it, it's rather sort of worrying because, and it could lead to the race to the bottom, mm -hmm. where if you have an uneven playing field where you have some parts of the world, the internet, where none of this is effectively controlled, and you have other places, like at the moment, sort of television, or other places where people are trying to have a separation between advertising and editorial, mm -hmm. you have a kind of mismatch between the revenue, the, mm -hmm. the search for revenues mm -hmm. which will teach, lead you towards ever greater confusion between advertising and editorial, mm -hmm. and, the ser and the desire for some kind of editorial integrity that mm -hmm. may lead you to separate those. But if you follow your ethical view, if you like, you run the risk of losing out on the revenues. It's a terrible problem, and I, the reason I don't, in the U.S., it doesn't get you very far to talk about regulation as, as it might here. Um, the Obama, I, right when Obama was elected, all of a sudden, you began to see companies in privacy, you know. But, but um, at the same time, it hasn't much happened, not, not much so far has happened. I don't know the answer. I, I, I guess I would like to believe the information respect thing. Uh, my, my problem with laws is they're often written in ways that are easy to get around. And, and uh, I think that from what I can see, that's true in many ways with the EU uh, in some situations when it comes to these data transfers. The real hard fact is that the US thrives on data today. You know, the, the U.S. is a data economy. It's an information economy. And lawmakers are concerned about killing the goose that is laying the only golden egg. And so uh, it is a, it's a really interesting problem. How do, you, how do you keep a company like, I mean, think about Microsoft, Yahoo, you know, Google. Um, these companies face international dilemmas, as you know, as well as national dilemmas like this. And so regulators are... Uh, very worried about upsetting what they see are companies that have worldwide clout. It's a, it's a terrible dilemma. Um, 
Th uh, thank you. For, that's a fascinating talk. I just had a couple of problems with terminology. Yeah. Maybe it's an American so thing. So do here. I. But we, 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 we just uh, on phone companies, you said, quote, uh, that um, they were conservative about their use of data. I wanted to you know, is that a bad thing? Over here, conservative plays a different, uh, I see. A different way. No, what and I mean I is cautious. 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 Uh, cautious. And accountability, the term accountability, I mean, David, it, 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 is accountability just a one-way street? Is accountability to advertisers? What about accountability to the, to the yeah, user? Well, the, uh, <laughs> no, and that's a fascinating issue because when, if you look in the trade press and go to industry meetings, people talk about transparency. They're talking about transparency between one another, companies to one another. So Google, uh, so the transparency of a website when your ads are going to run, tell us when they're going to run, tell us where they show up. That's what they mean by transparency. There's an enormous amount of data, an enormous amount of work going into the data that companies show their partners, and yet none of that gets ported over to the public arena. Um, that's why when I say to them, when I talk to these people in those companies, and they say, you know how hard it is to do the kind of thing you want, this privacy dashboard and all of that. Now, there are some real issues here that I can get into in a second. But I say, hard? You guys are doing this stuff all the time. It's not easy, but you're doing it with your clients. You're creating enormous amounts of, of uh, data and, and uh, uh, amazing programs, you know, f going out for your own interests. But they just don't want to do this kind of stuff. The other more interesting problem is the extent to which revealing certain data uh, gets them into secrets of the company. So people in Google will say, if we tell you too much about what we know about you, we're telling you too much about our, our company secret data. And so that becomes a kind of out, right? So how do I know whether that's true or not? You know? One more question. I, I just want to make a, a, a comparison. It seems to me you're talking about an asymmetry of power. Exactly. Yes. In a rather similar way, it's rather similar to the, to the situation of the shareholder. The mm. mythology mm -hmm. is that all shareholders Absolutely. are equal. Right. Uh, but I remember once as a young reporter going to a meeting where a guy stands up and criticizes the, the chairman of a, of a public company. And the chairman leans over the thing in a very patronizing way and says, how many shares do you have? Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm with the Prudential Insurance Company, 16,850,000. And the chairman right. had to go then and there. Yeah. Now, it seems to me we don't have any kind of uh, understanding mm -hmm. of the real balance of power between. Well, I think you're absolutely right. And to, to carry your metaphor a little farther, you know, the, the stocks that I own, Tiny, any, I get these these uh, suggestions that I have to vote. My proxy is important, yeah, you know, sure. and and I don't even have a chance to vote on who the people who are up for election are. No. So there's this whole myth about the dem democratic notion of voting in in stockholder meetings and stuff like that. It's highly problematical. There's some there are some issues that are related to this. It has to do with, as you say, the asymmetry of power. I just wonder uh, how much of this kind of user profiling has been used in uh, uh, politics like uh, election campaigning. Good question. And I'm no uh, expert at that, but I do know that it's becoming more and more the case uh, in a lot of ways. There's, there's a couple of good books on this. The one that comes to mind right away is called Applebee's America, which is uh, the beginning of uh, discussions of how it is, and in the 90s, the, the Democrats began to do this. If you have if you have Democrats, I believe it was this, in a sea of Republicans, how do you find those particular Democrats? So they would create profiles based on statistical evaluations of people that Democrats are people who do X and Y and Z. And based on this one group, that a large group that they found predictability from, they would then look for people like that in another area and send them the Democratic ads rather than to waste time trying to go after Republicans. So that's the beginning of this sort of thing. And if you think in many cases, um, in, in really high profile races, because of the condensed nature of this, sometimes the cost per individual, the amount expended is huge. So the amount of money available for this kind of research is, is enormous. And so yes, we're going to see more and more of this kind of thing. It used to be that p political communicators borrowed everything from marketers. Uh, to consumer marketers. Now we're seeing the other way too. It's a two-way street. The marketing people actually 
learn stuff from the political communication. But, but if that is the case, you think it's a negative thing or is it all right? You know, do I think it's negative or right? I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, I can see why a, a person would do this. Um, I, I don't have necessarily a problem based on the statistics of what I just told you. The, the question of, of uh, what is it? My ultimate question is what views of the world do people get based upon these institutional activities? That's what I care about. So it's hard to say bad or not bad. The question is what, what are the views of society that we're getting and to what extent is the balance between a society which shares and a society which is uh, kind of locked into their people's own little worlds. And I think a society has to have a balance. You have to have some media that allow you to go into your segments, a segment making media, you know, media for, for gays, for Catholics, for, you know, particular media. But you also have to have society making media, media that encourage the creation of, of larger uh, societies and understanding and fights across uh, those boundaries. And what I worry about increasingly is we're moving to just segment making. And that has some real interesting and problematical implications. Actually, I, several people want to ask questions, but I think we probably should close because people can ask you sure. informally. But maybe one trying to search for a positive direction. I mean, the uh, social networks are becoming more and more important mm -hmm. as referrals for news articles, for referrals to other things. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be countering some of this, or is that going to be just as Well, again, some bad. of that you may be right, but do you know of Rapleaf? There's a company called Rapleaf that's one of the companies that does this. Rapleaf basically scarfs up all the information they, they can get a hand on and who your friends are on social media sites. And then they do statistical evaluations of you based upon what they know about your friends. And that can have implications for the ads you get, but according to a New York Times article, it also relates to whether or not you get a mortgage. So mortgage companies have looked at, for bad and good, mortgage companies have looked at your friends' mortgage behaviors based on who your friends are and Facebook. And remember, your friends are open. You can't stop your friends from being known. So they will look at that and they'll say, well, these friends are pretty good at um, paying their mortgage. And we find statistically that people who have friends that are good paying mortgages are, are good paying mortgages, so even though they're on the margins, we'll give them a mortgage. Or just the opposite could be true. So I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong, and in fact it may have capabilities, but there's also that other part of it that we have to be wary of. I, I guess I'm trying to be a pessimist, but the reason I, the reason I do this is, is fundamentally because those companies, companies like Facebook and Google and Yahoo and others can speak for themselves. You know, they can tell us what they do well for society. I think it's, it's important for people who are outside of that process and who are fortunate like me to have the ability to talk about this. It's, it's our responsibility to not necessarily just go with the cheerleading, but to say, wait a minute, let's look to the other side. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was absolutely great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.